From Washington, D.C. to the heart of America, welcome to Mark Alford's America. I'm freshman congressman from Missouri, Mark Alford, and I believe in America. I believe in you, and most importantly, I believe our greatest days are still ahead. You know, each week we take you behind the scenes to share the stories, the news, the legislation, and to meet the, the great people who I have the honor of working with to help shape our great nation. Today, we're talking with a friend, Congressman Ralph Norman. Congressman Norman is a lifelong resident of South Carolina's 5th District. He's dedicated to improving his community and upholding conservative principles. Congressman Norman joined his father's construction business after graduating from Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina. He helped it grow into one of South Carolina's most successful commercial real estate developers. He's a husband to Elaine, father of four, grandfather to 17 grandchildren. He was sworn into office in 2017 and right now serves on the House Committee on Financial Services, Rules, and Budget. Please welcome to room 1516 of Longworth, Congressman Ralph Norman. Ralph, how you doing? Uh, doing great, Mark. Thanks for having me. I've always enjoyed doing these, particularly with you. You're a professional at this, and uh, glad to be a part of it. Well, thank you. Do you remember meeting with me when I was running for office? I came to the Capitol Hill Club. You probably met with a lot of people, but but you were very gracious. I, I tried to meet with as many sitting members as possible just to kind of get a read on what was going on in Washington. And you you impressed me greatly with your Southern charm because I grew up in, in Texas. And, of course, we have some of that in Missouri. But uh, what was it like growing up in South Carolina? Well, first, thank you. I appreciate you serving. You're making a difference up here, and I mean that sincerely. South Carolina, I grew up in a, in a rural community, Rock Hill, which is near Charlotte. And we always had horses. We always, you know, had farms to go to. And it was fun. It was uh, it was a great state. You had new people coming in, not as many as we do now. We have in my in in migration that are coming in because we got a great state. Regulations is low. Businesses are propping up, are coming up. So uh, I enjoyed it. We went to public schools and had a um, just a great community that's grown since I was a young man. Mm. Also from South Carolina, Nikki Haley, former governor, former ambassador to the U.N., former presidential candidate. You endorsed her. Why? A couple of reasons. One, Nikki Haley and I came in the legislature, South Carolina legislature, in 2005. She, I didn't know anything about her. As when she first came in, she ran for president of our uh, class, and she took on the establishment. She beat a 30-year incumbent and took on issues that no freshman really would tackle, like voting on the record. You know, you, you see unanimous consent where you couldn't track how politicians voted, mm -hmm. and, you know, what we face up here, the— a lot of the votes that people take, they like to get in the mesh and keep and, and keep them hidden. But she took that on. She ran for governor after I think three terms, and nobody thought she had a shot. I was in. I, I was one of two others that endorsed her. But I saw, you know, she. I saw what she would. She could do. I saw her. She had courage, and she had. Um, she would just jump in there, and she loves politics. Great communicator. And I think, you know, she started out with, when I endorsed her 13 months ago, she had 2% name recognition, no money. And when I called President Trump, because I respect him, what he did the four years that he was in office was like no other, particularly when you compare it to now. But nobody took Nikki seriously, including Donald Trump. But what she did to remain in the to end up being one of two people who could be president was no surprise to me because she no one one will outwork her and no one can communicate like she can. You think eventually she will be a president, the president of the United States? Yes. Uh, it's in her DNA. And she's got good. Her biggest asset, now she's smart, but her judgment, she knows she has street sense. She knows where to be. She knows how to read a crowd. She's... She's as good as I've ever seen. She is a Ronald Reagan uh, with the personality, and she delegates well. Uh, and she did the right thing to run. Competition helps everybody. And the fact she got out when she did was the right thing. 
So you backed President Trump last go around, correct? Have you talked to him since you backed Nikki Haley? I left word on his answer machine. I said, Mr. President, I'm 100 percent behind you. Thanks for what you did. I thank you for what you did. I will help you in Congress and help you in any way. And I was on Fox uh, the next morning with all the crowd and told them that. They, the big question was, are you going to endorse me? I said, yeah. And, of course, they came up. Nikki did not. Her words were let Trump attract her voters or sell himself to her voters. But I think she'll eventually come around to, to endorse him. But, you know, what we're facing now, and you know this, Mark, from being up here, it's a Democrat or Republican. We got, a, we got America to save. And there's no question everybody should get behind Donald Trump. It's not even a question. Now, if you don't, people who we rode up on the elevator just a minute ago, a lady hates, she saw my, my uh, pen and she it, said. You have a button on that says, stop the Biden border crisis. We'll talk about the border. But this lady on the elevator said what to you? Said, what, what, what is this? I said, well, I, I dislike Biden. She said, well, I dislike Trump. I said, well, that's the beauty of America. I love Trump. She said, well, I hate Biden. So I said, you know what? How do you answer that? So, well, so that's the beauty of America. You can have your own choice. And we're all Americans. We're all Americans. Correct. So what do you? how do you see the presidential race playing out now? Because Biden uh, has, has lost, I think, credibility. I think he's lost confidence from the American people. Uh, I, I certainly think he, he's lost a lot of synapses along the way. And I keep telling people, this is not about the number of years. It's not about his age. It's about the number of synapses in his brain. He has gone downhill very fast, and it does not look good for even the next six months. Well, it's scary. When you see him on TV, when he can't read a thank you note on a, from a teleprompter and the leader of the free world, they sense weakness. He can't even comprehend anything. It's really, you know, it's, um, it's unfair to him. For a wife that doesn't say, get out, it's, your time's come and gone. Well, so why are they doing that? Why do they continue to push? I've called him the marionette president from the beginning anyway. There's someone else pulling the strings. Joe Biden is not running this government. No. So why do they keep pushing him out onto the world stage to project weakness, which is a, which is a vulnerability for all of us in the United States of America? Well, look at his, look at what he's, not what he said. Not what you and I will hear tonight, but look what he's done. For the last three and a half years, he has opened our borders up to anybody and everybody, which is a national crisis. He has stopped drilling for oil here. I found out yesterday at RSC, I think you were there, Mm -hmm. Alaska. He's got 55 executive orders. He's shutting down Alaska. The crime crisis, I mean, you name it. I don't know what what this man has done well. Why do people vote in for him? Why will they vote for him? Why do they back him? Well, I, his by his actions, he sold out to China, and he can't understand anything, but he understands one thing, money. And what James Calmer and what Jim Jordan have on him now, checks to the big guy. $40,000 checks. Yeah, and uh, LLC accounts mm-hmm. that, he, that he can't uh, explain or hasn't explained. And uh, I think he sold out, I think, the buying of votes with student paying off student loans is asinine. Why are they supporting him? I think there's so many people that are on the government payroll now. Somehow they don't think it affects them. The $34 trillion, they just don't think it affects them. Now it's a little bit different because they're feeling it in their pocketbook. Your wife and my wife can't go to the grocery store without paying inflated prices. Try filling it up at the gas pump. Try getting supplies for your business. I'm in the real estate business. We build things. I can't get meter bases. And time is money. We've canceled two projects because, and probably three, because you can't. You, you, this administration on is, is oblivious. They've never been business people. You've had to meet a payroll. Right. And you know the time value of money. They do not. I'm on rules committee. They're answering what we will hear tonight, raise taxes. And for somebody that's been on the government payroll, as most, a lot of the Democrats have, They don't understand anything else. This is a fascinating conversation we're having with Congressman Ralph Norman from South Carolina. Hey, stay with us for Mark Alford's America. When we come back, we're going to talk about the border, immigration, government spending, overreach, overregulation. Some of the things that are really hindering growth in America. 
You're listening to Mark Alford's America. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Mark Alford's America, where we give you a behind-the-scenes look at Washington and let you meet some of the folks helping shape our nation. Today, we're talking with Congressman Ralph Norman of the great state of South Carolina. Ralph, let's talk about government spending, because I know you were on a couple of committees that, that uh, really dig into that, where we are $34.5 trillion in debt in America. You said before our break, you don't really think the American people are really tuned in to just how much of a threat this is to America's future. No, and when you say 34, 34 trillion, what does that mean to the, you average American? They can't fathom that, as I can. The interest I've heard that we're paying per second ranges anywhere from 40,000 40, per second up to 80,000, depending on what you include. And it's not just that debt. When you put Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, the Highway Trust Fund, all that's running the, in the red. So I would think we're more like in the 70s to 80 trillion, which somebody's got to pay back. And we just don't seem to focus on that up here. Look at the last budget, the minibus, as you call it. Mike Johnson inherited a bad problem, but to do the same thing over and over again, which is what we're doing with this minibus. Mm -hmm. I don't know how any conservative can vote for the $460 billion, six appropriation bills, $20 billion of that, with a B, is earmarks. I mean, when you look at, when you break it out, it's no, well, it is big numbers like the 1.9 to build an art and I think a social museum in New York, the $10 million for a sewer project in West Virginia with 680 people, 80, 500000 to fund a job in Virginia. I mean, you can go down the list. So how did we get in the position in, because I'm, I'm with you. I voted against this omnibus bill. I voted against the continuing resolutions. We've got to change the way we do business here uh, for the American people. But how did we get to the point where we thought it was a government's job, responsibility, the taxpayer's responsibility to fund projects, pet projects for individual districts? The way we got there is crony capitalism. I see it. Um, as a businessman, you will see it. What corporations have done or groups have done is put candidates up that will do the bidding for them. I was at an event last night with, with our staff, and I looked around. It was a lot of big-time CEOs there, and I thought to myself, we're no, and I told the staff, we're no match for them. Politicians, unless you made money and lost money, uh, these people that put uh, these corporations that put people up to do the bidding they give them all the money to run for office. I, you and I know how they're going to vote before they even go there for the most part. And they just don't look at it as their money. Every dollar that's spent in D.C. has got an advocate for it. And you have the same peak groups that come to you with their hand out. And my comment now is show me where how, how we're going to offset this. And of in your world, the money you're asking me for, you know where the abuse is, where the where you can add value to tell me what to cut out of the federal budget. But we just can't continue this. Well, one of the solutions, I believe, is uh, your bill for term limits. That has not hit the House floor after promises from various leaders that we would have a vote on term limits. We t we've... Went against McCarthy. I, we met with him. All of us did. That were I was one of the five that objected. Was not going to give him my, my tell him I was going to vote for him. And and you know as when he came when we met with him, his first response was, "What's it going to take? What do you want?" I said, "Kevin, I don't want anything. I, I think what makes sense though is let let us have on the, to put on the floor term limits. My bill had three terms in the house, six years." Two terms right. in the Senate. I signed on to that. Let's each, yeah, you did. Um, and we had probably those who had signed the pledge, we had, I don't know, over 100 and something signatures that got onto it, uh, got to the Judiciary Committee, and guess who voted it down? Republicans. All the Democrats did, but Republicans. It's an 80% issue uh, that people support. You mentioned term limits in a speech, they go wild in support. Um, that single subject bills, uh, you know, let it come through regular order. He said, and I didn't know people thought we negotiated for the, for me being on rules. I didn't. I didn't know anything about rules. 
Never been on it. Didn't know the time commitment, but I'm glad I'm on it. Uh, but seat, you know, seats on appropriations, put conservatives who have nothing to gain from the system. Uh, I don't have anything to gain from the way I vote. Neither do you. But um, the only way we get out of this is is really start voicing our opinion, voting down um, bills that you know should go through regular order. Right. They're doing it on suspension. As you know, you have to get three fourths to two eighty nine, and it's passed with Democrats. For, for 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 those you're on rules. For those who don't know what we're talking about. If it's voted on suspension, it does not have to go through the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee determines the amount of debate, the amendments that will make it onto the bill. It's part of the regular order. Part of the regular order. The way order. it should be done. The way it should be done. And that's how, that's the process. You have amendments, you have closed bills, and then you have those that can have amendments. And we've had a lot of some closed rules, but the, but on on. To, to make the system work, it needs to go through regular order and debate. That's the American way. And we're just not having it now. And that's the, the prerogative of the Speaker. And we're going to be addressing that with Mike. We have been. We're going to address, address it even more. Aside from the, I, I believe, the existential threat that our, our nation's debt um, puts us in right now, the, the, the threat of our nation not existing because we can't handle the debt, I also think the border is another issue that could lead to the ruin of America. When you let 8 to 15 million illegal aliens into our sovereign nation, uh, it's putting a stress on the fabric of America, number one. But it's also is, it's an uncertainty of who's here to do us harm in a lot of ways. It's interesting you say that. I got a call just as I was coming over here from a former police officer who said, have you read up on the long knives? I said, no. He said, you're going to have attacks that are going to make 9-11 look small. He was warning me, he, and he felt bad about it. Mm. When you hear the Eric Princes, of, who's a SEAL and who has done a lot of work overseas, and say it's just a matter of when, and the seriousness of this, and this is what I really fought President Biden on, to put this country at risk and to let over 160 countries, ones we're at war with, let their people in. And the guy that called me, for your listeners, had the numbers of Chinese nationalists, uh, those from Cuba, Venezuela, who are military-age men. They got their backpacks on. Who are in our country now. In the country now. And he... he sleeper cells. Sleeper cells. And it's not... And his he had a pretty dire prediction for us, because this is the cradle of of democracy physically Washington DC and for whatever else they choose to hit it's going to happen quick and those were his words to me not mine he said it's going to happen quick and he was a part of putting down rebellion uh, because he escaped from Cuba he said I know what I'm talking about and he does that being said we got to do just to complain about it we got to do something about it and I'm not voting for anything that doesn't have border security on it and we're going to make that known to, to the speaker. This is a serious national threat. We owe it to the American people. And so, but the two cancers are overspending in the border. That's the cancer that's killing this country. And aspirin is not going to cure it. you got to have drastic measures. But we just don't seem to be the bulk of the, bo- the, the body up here. It just doesn't take that seriously. Why is that? Why do the Democrats, why does Biden want another 15 million people here? When I went to the border, they had cardboard boxes with numbers on it when mary miller and i took a picture mm-hmm. a american came to me in 10 seconds and said you can't take the picture we're going to take your camera he said we said we're not going to take our camera we're in, in congress with and uh they're putting them all over the country i got I had a, a lady that you know got beat for congress got word that a plane was flying into atlanta that had 300 and something uh illegals on it they went to they landed a private place in the airport the Atlanta airport went to a underground place this is all paid for by our tax dollars mark i mean this this was the insanity it's uh for young people uh this is what they're going to be paying for if we still exist as a country we if we lose this election though we won't have anything to worry about and the country will be gone ralph thank you so much for being with us my honor i wish i had another hour with you well 
it's an honor to do it. I like mm -hmm. uh, like what you're doing. You're informing the people, and you're doing a service, which is why you're in this job. Thank you. Hey, folks, thank you for joining us for Mark Alford's America. We'll talk again next week. Until then, remember, I believe in you. I believe that our best days are still ahead of us. And Ralph Norman, I believe in America.